My colleague talked about compassion and about autonomy. And both those points are of very, very great importance. The kindness that we feel towards our fellows in society makes a claim on us, makes a claim on us to consider the circumstances in which they find themselves in very difficult times of their lives. Remember that uh, we're talking here about assisted dying. We're not actually talking about death. That's something that happens when dying, the process has come to an end. We're talking about an experience which is a living experience, something experienced by the person undergoing it. And we're talking about the degree of compassion, the degree of kindness, insight, preparedness to help towards somebody going through that experience. In fact, uh, the autonomy point speaks to this because if you think about what we have in mind when we talk about the right that an individual has to make decisions about tremendously important things in their lives, like how and when they die, and whether they find life still worth living or not, and whether if they're not in a position to help themselves to die, they can legitimately claim the help of their fellows in society to be released from their suffering. When we think about that, we're thinking about something very fundamental, which is a right. Those of you who have been uh, studying what has happened in the last, let us say, decade on this matter in the courts of this country, in the number of cases which have come up before the courts, the Diane Pretty case, for example, the Tony Nicholson case recently, you will have noticed that the legal representatives of those who were seeking uh, the, the license from society to end their lives or to be helped to end their lives, to be assisted in the process of dying, appealed to the uh, human rights that are now embodied in our English law. And this is the European Convention of Human Rights, which by means of the Human Rights Act uh, came into effect in the year 2000. And there are three articles of that act that are prayed in aid. The second uh, article is the right to life. The third, the right to be protected from inhumane and cruel treatment. And the eighth, which accords privacy to individuals. And the concept of privacy there is a broad one. It entails uh, that individuals have the scope, the margin, to make these important decisions for themselves. Decisions, for example, about whether they marry, whether they have a family, and um, in the arguments put before the courts, uh, the right to make decisions about how long they, they live. In 1961, the Suicide Act of, of that year decriminalized suicide. It may be surprising to know that prior to that time, if you attempted suicide and failed, you could be prosecuted for doing so. And there are still plenty of jurisdictions where if you don't succeed in killing yourself, you can get into trouble for it. But the 1961 Act decriminalized suicide, but it left uh, a provision saying that anybody who helps someone, who aids or abets or encourages someone to commit suicide, is liable for criminal prosecution. So this means that somebody who is incapable of committing suicide, who wants to, and now has a, a right to implied in decriminalization, is in the catch-22 that they can't end their lives if they need to because they can't get anybody to help them, that person might be prosecuted. Now, I'd like you to reflect a little on these rights. Think about the right to life. Suppose I imprison you in a very small cage and I give you some bread and water occasionally, keep you alive. I, am I respecting your right to life? Surely not. Surely a right to life is a right to, to a certain minimum quality of life. And given the complexity of, of uh, human nature and uh, uh, the human mind, the quality of life which is implied is a, something of quite a high degree of complexity. A right to life is a right to a life worth living. And when in the judgment of the person living it, that life has ceased to be worth living, it behoves us to respect the judgment that that person has made and as an act of kindness or compassion, to help them if they're not able to help themselves, to be released from a life that they find no longer worth living. So it seems to me that there is implicit in the second article of our Human Rights Act an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, life should be of a certain minimum quality and the only person who can make a judgment about that is the person living it, the person experiencing the process of dying. Article 3, which says that we mustn't subject people to inhumane treatment. Surely it's the case that if somebody wishes to be released from life, can't take an action that would bring about that desired result, himself or herself, and they ask us, they plead with us to help them to be released, surely it is inhumane and cruel to deny them that. I think that those two expressions, 
inhumanity and cruelty actually apply to those people who deny to people who have a settled, clear-minded intention to leave life, a settled, clear-minded desire to leave life, if they deny them that they are being inhumane and cruel to them. And lastly, the Article 8 right to privacy or right to self-determination. Surely that is the, the, uh, the, the, should be the final word in this matter because it, it uh, implies that in the end and ultimately it is only the actor, himself or herself, who can make those judgments and those choices which affect the entire quality and aim and direction of a life, its purpose, that can infuse into a life its meaning, and which, when life has become intolerable, can choose to end it and to ask, if necessary, to be helped to be released from it. These are tremendously important ideas because they are ideas that come out of the very concept of a life worth living, of a full, rich human life the end of which and the manner of the end of which is an important part of the story of that life. And to think that by legal means, that by opposition, particularly when the opposition is based on very tendentious principles, most of the opposition, as you're perfectly conscious, comes from the idea that uh, life is not an individual's to make choices about ultimately because life is given by some other agency, a transcendent agency, a deity or deities who, having been the givers of this life, are the only ones entitled to take it away. This is a view which is, uh, has its roots in the view, the metaphysics and the morality of people who lived several thousand years ago. We now, having much, much more respect for individuals and also the means to provide individuals with genuine help when they need it, should be thinking differently, more sympathetically and with much greater kindness. So for these, these reasons, I ask you to support the motion that we should legalize assisted dying.